where students go, oh, no, don't skip the videos. So actually, maybe I'm not. I did go ahead and get it plugged in. So we already did this slide. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of backtrack, take a running start at what I want to kind of quickly go over in this first part. Um, remember that logic tree that matter can either be a pure substance or a mixture? Okay, and under pure substance, it can either be an element or a compound. And I would add another branch, although it's not on that, um, that figure, with a compound. A compound can either be a molecular compound or an ionic compound. So I just have one slide each to kind of summarize what I think is the major difference between those two types of compounds. Use a chemical formula, like the chemical formula for waters, H2O, okay? The chemical formula for sodium chloride is one sodium, Na, one Cl, Cl, okay? Um, but if it is a molecular compound, then I kind of mentioned on Wednesday that you can take, it's like a magician who's kind of pretending, making us believe that somebody is elevating or levitating, <laughs> okay? Like they levitate something, they take their hands and they go like that, okay? So it's one unit, one molecule. Contrast that with, on Wednesday, I did show the animation where sodium chloride has kind of that alternating Na plus Cl minus, Na plus Cl minus with those little gray bonds, okay? You can't take your hands and go around it like that. That's, um, sodium chloride is an example of an ionic compound. Okay, so it's like, I don't know where one starts and the other ends. Okay, so another thing that you are already, I'm sure, familiar with is the three main phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. So we can kind of, if we were to look closely, for instance, at water in its um, solid, oops, see, these two, isn't that terrible? Don't blame me. What's wrong with this? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, solid, liquid, and gas. Okay. Um, but I don't think I'll have to double check if that's me or the textbook. Maybe it's the I'll have to check the figure. Okay. Inquiring minds. I think it's me because I'll recognize that blue font. But anyway, bless you. We, we all knew that this was a solid because those dot, dot, dots, those are hydrogen bonds, okay? Those are, those are what we call, um, they aren't chemical bonds, they're intermolecular bonds, okay? And we'll talk more about that later. Is it, is it me? They, mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't have this label. Oh, yep, I added it. Okay, well, it's fixable if it's me. Um, so water in a solid state, an ice cube, has got hydrogen bonding, and it's actually fluffed out like this. When you add heat, those, uh, those dot, dot, dots, those bonds between the water molecules break, and you get a liquid, and it collapses. You add a little bit more heat, and you get water vapor. So we'll see if this little animation works for us. If, you're, if you've taken physics, you've talked about um, the two broad types of energy, kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy is associated with motion. So all matter has a certain amount of kinetic energy because all matter has motion, even if it's solid. Okay, And so um, that kind of summarizes what we call the kinetic molecular theory. It's not going to do it for me. Again, the three phases of matter over here on the left, and we can talk in terms of generally describing it, how many inter intermolecular bonds it has, and how much kinetic energy it has. Okay, so for instance, with regard to size and shape, with regard to size and shape, we would say that a solid, you can't, I mean, the size it is, is the size it is. And the shape it is, is the shape the solid is. If we compare that to a gas, Okay, a gas will go ahead and fill your container. A gas is expandable and compressible. Okay, and so its volume can change. Okay, it's what we say indefinite, and so also is its shape. Liquid, its volume is pretty much set, uh, but it can change its shape. Okay, so then with regard to those little connecting things, those connecting things, for instance, between the water molecules, we say the ice cube has a high degree of connection. Inter what we call those connections are intermolecular bonds. We say the gas, basically, if it's behaving ideally, basically all those bonds have been broken, and it's run around as independent gas water vapor particles. Okay, and liquids somewhere in between. 
So with regard to energy, okay, we could say that um, the, all solids have motion, but they have the least amount of kinetic energy, the least amount of motion. Gases, on the other hand, have the most amount of kinetic energy. So those dot, dot, dots that we saw a minute ago with the ice, the H2O bonded together in a solid state, that's an example of intermolecular forces. So in general, if you're going to connect um, molecules or uh, molecules and ions or ions and ions, those are going to be dot, dot, dots, what we call intermolecular forces. Um, Here's a short video. It's a pretty one. Maybe. One thousand one, one thousand two. and molecules are in constant motion. Heat increases this motion. The amount of motion dictates how well atoms and molecules can hold on to each other. The less motion there is, the better the hold, and the more solid the matter. When liquid water is cold enough, its molecules arrange in a particular structure and turn to ice. When heated, the vigorous motion of liquid water molecules separates them from one another, and they become an invisible gas. See, isn't that pretty? I'm going to say something else. Oh, who else thinks that water molecules look like a Mickey Mouse? I'm just saying, the whole red is the oxygen, and little white are the hydrogens. That's what I think. OK. Um, those intermolecular bonds we've been talking about, um, it's going to take energy, usually in the form of heat, to break those, to change physical phases. And when uh, something forms those intermolecular bonds, like when a gas goes to a liquid or a liquid goes to a solid, if you were tracking energy, actually that system would be releasing energy, spitting energy back. In meteorology, when we look at um, cloud formation, all cloud is is basically water vapor going to form a liquid. Okay. And so bonds are being formed. And so within the cloud, if you had a thermometer, it gets hot within the cloud because bonds are formed. So that's kind of neat. OK. Um, so properties. Properties are a way to describe a characteristic of something. So there's a couple different ways to kind of say it's got this property. One way is to talk in terms of a physical or chemical property or characteristic. Um, sorry. Yeah. A physical property means that it can just be measured without destroying the thing itself. It's one way to get to think of it, okay? Physical property. Color, you know, it's conductivity or not conductivity, lack of conductivity. Those are things that we can measure without destroying the thing. A chemical property or characteristic of something, you have to do some sort of chemistry. And a chemi some sort of chemical reaction has to occur. And bottom line, uh, when a chemical reaction occurs, new substances are formed. So it's a destructive method. Okay, it's a destructive look at that substance. Um, so these are all um, these are all physical properties. No molecules were harmed during the measuring of these properties. Okay. Uh, physical property, just kind of appearance here. We would say these two substances on the left and right in the test tube, they're both white. Kind of a quick and dirty test to see which one is um, aspirin and which one is naphthalene is to go ahead and see the temperature they melt at. It's kind of convenient because we know water boils about 100 degrees Celsius, okay, depending upon the pressure of the atmosphere, about 100 degrees Celsius. And the deal is, is this solid should melt um, below 100 degrees Celsius, and that solid, aspirin, will melt above 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so just kind of a quick and dirty test, kind of convenient. 
that one will mount and one won't, of identifying what's what. But again, when we see the temperature at which something melts, okay, that's a, that's a physical phase change. Okay? It's still naphthalene and aspirin before it melts and after it melts. No molecules were harmed during the process of melting. Um, so in blue, you already see that these are kind of a mixture of physical and chemical properties. The chemical uh, properties or characteristics during the measuring of that, that characteristic, something was destroyed. Okay. So another way to measure properties is, a proper, is, is kind of go this way, kind of yin and yang. Is it an intensive property or an extensive property, a characteristic of that matter? And I think the other day I said um, intensive, if you start with intensive and think um, independent of amount. That's the way I remember it. Independent of amount. Okay? So this one does depend on amount. Amount counts. Oh, no pun intended. Okay? So. An example of an example. She's talks louder than me. An example of when amount counts, um, for instance, is how much heat am I going to get from burning burning paper? How much heat am I going to get? Because you know, you think you get more heat if you burn more paper. Yeah. yeah. So amount counts. So it's kind of like well. It depends. Do you have 10, 10 pieces of paper or do you have 50 pieces of paper? Okay, so the amount of energy you'll get while you burn something depends upon amount. Mass is another example of an, of a, of an extensive property. Amount counts. Extensive property amount counts. Like, again, back to the paper. What does it weigh? Well, amount counts. Okay, I know, it just like runs. Um, intensive property. Um, an example of that is color. You know, if you go back to those te two test tubes, I don't care how much many grams of naphthalene you have, um, unless it's if it's pure, it's like white. -ish. Okay. Um, another thing that's independent of amount is um, the temperature at which something changes phases. You know, take water. Water boils, changes phase from a liquid to a gas at 100 degrees Celsius. Water does. Okay. It doesn't matter if I have a cup of water or if I have a big old vat of water. That's the character, you know, independent of the map. Okay, so physical change and chemical change kind of go along with physical property and chemical property. Okay, a physical change, no molecules were harmed during that change. A chemical change, something, new substances were formed. So, um, kind of some examples of chemical changes and physical changes. All right. Woohoo! Assignment slide. So, yeah, I skipped a few. Those videos that I skipped, we will be seeing, though. Um, let me go ahead and pull up these right quick. All right. So, this part is going to ultimately talk about significant figures, and if you're rolling your eyes, I know, <laughs> you're going to get The good thing about significant figures is it's like universal for all the sciences. So it's like you cover it in physics, you cover it in chemistry, it's all the same. I don't think biology worries about significant figures, quite frankly. Okay, but before we talk about significant figures, let's just talk about um, measured quantities in general. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about standards because um, we are one little world these days with the internet and scientists need to talk to each other. So we need to compare like an inch back to an inch somewhere else. Okay, gone are the days of bartering and, you know, a foot is about the size of that guy's foot. Or, you know what I mean? Okay, so we need a reference. Anytime we talk about measurements in general, if we're talking about mass, I always think of Higgs boson, you know, they kind of the little particle that gives, acts with gravity to give things weight, but weight and mass are not the same thing. But mass is, is kind of, I think of mass is like how many atoms or molecules there are. Length is the distance between two points. 
Volume then can be actually length cubed. We're going to see back to a reference standard. Um, how much volume something occupies is how much space occupies. And temperature, temperature and heat are not the same thing. Um, heat and energy, thermal energy are the same thing. But temperature is just kind of a snapshot of the kinetic energy of something. That's what temperature is. It's important, but it's yeah, not the same thing as an energy in its entirety. Um, so these are the standards that we link back to with regard to mass, length, and volume. Um, actually, that little um, iridium, platinum, metal, one kilogram metal thing that's under a dome jar that's like behind lock and key in Paris, France, that's been in the news because I read it's like losing weight. It shouldn't be. <laughs> so I don't know. So that's the, um, that's the standard that all um, uh, scales go back to. If you're out there in the factory, a lot of times they'll say around here, that scale is traceable back to, it's, it's NIST traceable. And ultimately, that would go back to um, Length goes back to how fast light travels um, in one second. Uh, volume goes back to length. Um, time goes back to um, an oscillation of energy that one isotope of cesium releases. Okay. Um, and that's a, that's a big, that's a lot of oscillations in one second. <laughs> Um, temperature, uh, your thermometers, goes back to the triple point of water. And I had to double check. I Googled it, right? The triple point of water. Triple points are when the three physical phases we talked about all coexist in equilibrium. So solid, liquid, and gas all coexist at one temperature. But it's actually, it's an ordered pair. It's one temperature and pressure. Okay, so the triple point temperature for water is about zero degrees Celsius, which, if you remember your scales, is about 273 Kelvin, okay, 273.15 Kelvin. So that's where that comes in. The pressure in the triple point of water is like way less than an atmosphere. Anyway, amount goes back down to um, how many particles are there of a particular version or isotope of carbon, carbon-12, in um, exactly 12 grams of carbon. So that's got to have a picture. Watch, this is my picture of the mount. OK, here's my little blob of carbon-12, C12, one isotope, one version of the element of carbon. And it weighs exactly 12.00 grams. OK, and these are my carbon atoms. There is one mole. And as you know, one mole is 6.022, say it with me, times 10 to the 23rd C12 atoms. I just love a mole. I know. OK. All right. So again, measuring. This, these things would measure a liquid. OK. You guys told me yesterday in lab this was a very good, a graduated cylinder. So those white marks are gradations. So there's gradations on your beaker, but which one would be more accurate, you think? How many people think it's the graduated cylinder? Yeah, me too. Very good. So we have an assortment of um, accuracies. We're going to talk about accuracy and precision. They're not the same thing. But all of these can kind of do the whole volume thing. Bless you. Okay? Um, all right. So over here... You have um, the symbol for the international standard unit of measurement for these things. <coughs> Length, mass, and time. Meter, not the gram, the kilogram for mass. Seconds, we don't do much with seconds here. Um, and the temperature standard unit of temperature in physical science is Kelvin. Um, moles, abbreviated MOL. Ampere is current. Um, and we don't do anything with uh, luminosity. OK. Ah, uh, yes. I'm going to tell you the metric prefixes that you're going to need to know. You don't need to know all those. Dang. Anytime in this slides or in this series of slides, if I have arrows, those arrows are know those. OK. So the metric prefixes you need to know, 
There's actually only one big one. Now, I say you need to know it. There's homework where you need to use Pico and Nano, I think, and a little more obscure ones that I don't mark that you need to memorize. But you need to memorize kilo is 1,000 times the base unit. And then I have four smaller ones, centi, milli, micro, and nano. Is one one hundredth, one one thousandth, one one millionth, and one one billionth. Chemistry is about small stuff in general, not always. So it could be worse. Gotta memorize stuff. Okay, so centi was one to memorize. Centi means one one hundredth of the base unit. You know you can use those metric prefixes with meters or grams or liters. Okay, it's kind of a mix and match sort of deal. Um, so one centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter. Okay. This is our first look. I knew she was coming, so we're okay. These are what we call, thanks, what we call equivalency statements. You see the word equals? And I usually hold my two hands out and say the quantities are equal. We're good with that. Um, so one of the things you know is that if, and uh, now I'm counting on you doing the whole algebra thing, right? On either side of the equal sign, as long as you do the same thing, it's fair game. Okay, so all I've introduced here is a term of 100 on both sides of the equal sign. We're good with that. And then the beauty of it is these 100s cancel, don't they? All right. So just rewrite it. So now we have 100 centimeters is equal to one meter. It's not magic, I know. But I've drawn a box around two equivalency statements that can, what I will say, get you down the road to link those two quantities within the metric system. Okay, we could say one centimeter is 0 0.01 or one one hundredth of a meter, or we could say 100 centimeters is equal to one meter. Same diff. Okay. All right, another arrow. Dun, dun, dun. You must memorize the relationship between the metric system of length and the English system of length. And the... I will emphasize, because we'll be talking about why this is so important compared to the relationship for uh, volume and mass between the English and metric system. You don't have to memorize these relationships for volume and mass between the two. We call the English system the imperial system versus the metric system, English metric. Okay. Um, I'll just go ahead and say that this is by definition. That's supposed to be the word definition up there. Okay. That's how they got to be equal. Another arrow. Okay. This is within the metric system, volume within the metric system. One milliliter is exactly equal to a cube that is one centimeter by one centimeter, it's smaller than that, one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter, a cube like that, okay, one centimeter cube is equal to one milliliter. Makes you want to go out and test Okay, so memorize that one. Um, for mass, the standard unit of measurement is kilogram, but of course, G is the base unit for, for mass. Um, lower case, it's case sensitive. Uh, lowercase m for uh, meters, uppercase l for liters, s is a lowercase, second, excuse me, is lowercase s. Okay. All right. How are we doing? And these are some things, again, when we're talking about units of measure, um, case matters, like I said just a minute ago. Um, it's tempting, and I probably will catch myself, don't put a period at the end of it, even though it's like a, an abbreviation of a, of a measurement. And don't make it plural. Like grams is not GMS. It's just GM. But we pronounce it grams. So. Um, a lot of don'ts there. Okay. Accuracy versus precision. 
And I'm going to show the old proverbial dartboard here in a minute. I think it really works well. Okay. Accuracy, in order to know how accurate something is, I never thought about it until just now, in order to understand how accurate something is, a measurement is, you need to have, you need to know what the real value is. Okay. So accuracy implies you know what that value is, and you measure it, and you see how close it is to what, it should, what, what you know it to be. That's accuracy. Precision assumes, again, that you have done multiple, you've done more than one run. You have measured that quantity more than one time. That's the only way you can get precision. So precision's about scatter, actually. How do your measurements agree? Um, and accuracy is how close are you to the right value? So there is a difference between the two. So that's why they kind of lend themselves to a dartboard, because I'm not a dart player, but I think you're supposed to get in, in the bullseye, right, in the middle. So in this first scenario, you can see that Accuracy-wise, it's not happening, okay? To me, um, and I don't think you're, this figure does this, but if you were going to see maybe what kind of accuracy it was, you'd have to kind of eyeball the average position of those darts. You could do it vector analysis, okay? But to me, the middle still kind of is off the center. All right. Cluster's awesome, <laughs> okay? but it's not in the bullseye. So this is an example of great precision, repeatability, okay? Accuracy, not so much. And here you go, hit the bullseye and nice tight cluster. Okay, so it's accurate because it hit the bullseye. It's precise because it repeated itself. When you send away a sample for analysis, whether it's an environmental sample or a CSI sample, you know, blood sample, whoever's doing the measurement in the lab will always have to tell you the, the tolerance of their instrument or how their instrument is performing for that particular analysis. Okay. All right. So error means you're a little bit off. So you're off the bullseye. You're off what you know it should be. Okay. So error is associated with accuracy. Okay. And scatter is associated with precision. Another way to kind of think of scatter is uncertainty. Okay, so say you ran something 10 times, and you know kind of what the value should be, but you're, and, and you got an average value with that, but your, your data is all over here. You got the average right, okay. So your scatter is bad. So you got a lot of uncertainty. Okay, and that's your precision. You might be accurate, but. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about how to measure accuracy and precision. There's absolute error, and then there's relative error coming up. And as you might imagine, statistics is in here somewhere, okay? The t-test, this sort of thing. Okay, so there's absolute error or uncertainty, and absolute, or excuse me, relative error. Or uncertainty. Notice how when I presented those, I'm kind of taking the uncertainty and kind of unemphasizing that. Because I really believe this is more um, comparing your, um, comparing it to a true value. So for instance, absolute error. What is it? Well, you got an average value, say you ran it 10 times, so you're going to go with the average, and you're going to compare that average to what the real value is. Okay, and you're going to do subtraction. It can be positive or negative. And we're going to do some of this in lab. They say you were biased high, it's going to be positive. You're biased low, it's going to be negative. Okay. Then relative error um, is where you go ahead and take um, the absolute error divided by, which is the difference between what you got, average of what you got, and, and what the, the known value is, divided by the known value. Um, and again, you're going to be doing this in the lab. You're going to be doing experiments where you know what the answer is supposed to be. You're like, well, why would we do the experiment? <laughs> uh, so um, when you do this division, this percent right here, um, you will get a relative uh, division. It'll be what we call unitless. And you'll see, we'll see how those, the units drop out coming up. Okay, I'm so excited. Now, significant figures. Um, let me go ahead and tell you 
that um, I abbreviate it affectionately known as sig figs. Okay, so if I write that on your paper, that's what I'm talking about. Um, sometimes um, I learned it as significant digits. Okay, all the same thing. I'm sure you can make that leap pretty easy. Oops. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, significant figures are important. And, you know, oh, we roll our eyes. But honestly, they, I use the phrase, thou shalt not lie. Because honestly, if you round and show the wrong significant number of significant figures in your answer, you're lying. And you don't mean to, so I should say that. You're, li you're misleading your answer, okay, if you round wrong to the wrong number of significant figures. And that have, could have consequences down the road, okay. So rounded correctly or manipulated correctly, we are um, relaying the uncertainty that was in our measurement. Okay, so all measured quantities have wiggle room. All measured quantities have uh, eh, uncertainty in them. Okay, you might say, well, I bought a pound and a half of hamburger. Well, 1.5 pounds of hamburger. But was that assuming 1.5 plus or minus 0.1? Okay, wiggle. Okay, I'm going to be there in a minute. Do you mean 1.0 minutes? <laughs> Do you mean 1.3 minutes? Okay, wiggle. And as I said, those numbers, 1.5 pounds of hamburger or 1.3 seconds, okay, the wiggle is in that last digit, the 0.5 or the 0.3. That's like the hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, when I do problems, I kind of put a check mark over a digit or a figure that's significant, so my check marks. And sometimes zeros are what gets us. So sometimes over the zero, I will put an X, like, no, it's not significant. All righty, the rules. OK. Um, one is that thou shalt only give one hey, uncertain number. So in the examples I said a minute ago, 1.5 pounds. I'll put a question mark over the, the five in the tenths place. It's like, hey, OK. Uh, 1.3 seconds. I'll put a question mark over the three in the tenths place. Okay. If your measuring device only goes to the nearest tenth, thou shalt not say 1.5000. Zero, zero, zero. Because in a minute, or no, I think we'll get to it today, we're going to see that's a different scale. If you report this, oh, no naked numbers. That means you honestly have a scale that probably costs a lot of money, <laughs> okay, that can measure out to, some would say, a gnat's eyebrow. Have you ever heard that? It's like, all right. Okay, so you can only report one wiggle one. Okay, and like this says in italics, and I was showing you, it's the one to the most left. No, right, darn it. It's the one to the most right. I get my left and right mixed up. That one over there, the trailing, that's where the uncertainty is, the last digit. Okay, so I said all measured quantities have me in it, right? Well, for every rule like that, it's meant to be broken. And here, we're breaking it. There are some measured quantities that are right on. They are an exact quantity. They are a known quantity. And they fall into two categories. One is I could measure amount of students in here. One, two, measure the amount. And there's no uncertainty in there. There's no wiggle in that. We don't have like a part of a person hiding somewhere. Okay, so a number by counting, it's exact. Okay, no uncertainty. And it has consequences if you use an exact number in a calculation. The other one is if it's by definition. Uh, length, remember I said one inch is exactly equal to 2.54 centimeters. Commit that to memory and exact. No. <laughs> okay. So when we use them, or when we go to count, where when we go to look for the uncertainty, one way to look at it is when we go to say, where's the question mark? Like counting the number of students in here. Like um, say we are, I don't know, 12 people in here. 12. Point zero, 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 zero. Like where do we put the uncertainty? We know what it is. So it's clear out there. Infinite number of significant figures. Okay, 
So now here's my check for a significant figure, an x for maybe over a zero that's not significant. So first off, if it's a measured quantity and it has uncertainty, you count sig figs, you just even, even it's exact number, I guess. You, if, it, if it's not zero, it counts. Okay, so I'll see if this will work. So an example of that is 1,200 and, sorry, um, yeah, 1,230. Okay, nope, better make that into a 1. Okay, so 1, 231. We would say there are four sig figs there. Smiley face. Okay. That's rule number one, because those are all non-zero digits. Um, if there is a zero and it's nested between two numbers that aren't zero, it counts. So an example of that would be um, 1,023. Okay, so these count, the one, the two, and three count, and that zero counts because it's nested between the one and the two. Now, and we saw an example of this a minute ago, when I said you had a, the fancy scale that gave you a hamburger that was 1.50000 pounds, okay, um, those 0000s, those were trailing zeros after the decimal, and they do count. So, 1.50000. The 1 and the 5 count, because they're not zero, and then these are all trailing zeros after the decimal. Oops. So I got six sig figs there. Count sig figs. Okay. The last rule is if you have zeros, but they're what I call placeholders. This last rule only works for small numbers. Like if you have point zero 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 five six. Okay. The the zero 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 are just placeholders. Okay, so five and six count because of rule number one, and those three zeros don't count. Okay, yeah? Wouldn't the zero in front of the decimal not count either? Right. You're right. Um, I usually just ignore that because some students don't put that zero. I like to put it, but yeah, that doesn't count either. Very good. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about this ambiguity later. But what this is talking about is it says you have a trailing zero that's before a decimal, but the decimal is what we call implied. An example of that is 1,230. 1,230. If I asked you where the decimal place is, you would tell me behind the, zero. behind the zero, and you'd be right. But what I would differentiate is I'm going to put a little dot, 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 dot around that decimal because we know it's there. It's implied. Okay? Um, an opposite of implied is explicit. Explicit. Let me show you how that works. The same number, 1,230. But if I wanted to make a point, no pun intended, I could explicitly put that decimal there. Okay. Where down here it was implied. All right. So you guys have the answers to these? And your how many sig figs? Hold up number. Hold up your fingers. I'm liking it. Okay. Hold up your fingers. How many sig figs? <laughs> Five. Do you buy that? Okay. Let me know. Okay. Hold up your fingers. How many sig figs? Three. There's, there are three because this one is, I can't remember which rule it was, but it's a, it's a trailing zero after the decimal. 
that it's just like having a fancy that 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 fancy scale that just happen to be zeros out there. Okay, and these are significant because um, they're between two numbers that aren't zero. So we had five there. Okay, one more. Hold up your fingers. <laughs> yes, I'm liking it. Okay, very good. Hold up your fingers. Two. Peace. Okay, cool. Okay. Well, that's a good place to, because we're bumping up against the clock, kind of take a running start at it. So there's only, there's that homework at the end of part one that's due on Monday. Okay, and I do have office hours um, before this class, so. But you should do great. You don't need me. <laughs>